Okay, so last time we discussed the problem of medical harm. Uh, we identified different sorts of bad things that can happen to patients, and we noted that iatrogenesis was a leading killer, in fact, in the top 10 uh, killers in the United States. And we discussed very way, various ways of responding to this problem, focusing on both patient and physician agency, and also on structure. And we reviewed various structural adjustments that reduce harm and error constraining the doctor's agency. And finally, we talked a little bit about Illich's very important idea of social iatrogenesis. Today we're going to be speaking about religion, and religion and distinctly religious organizations often fulfill diverse functions, providing for the needy, keeping people connected, fulfilling symbolically important functions, preserving wisdom and norms in the culture, and so on. And sometimes these even might be at odds with each other. Um, if you look at this... Um, at this picture, you'll see, uh, so uh, evenings at 7 at the parish hall, Monday, Alcoholics Anonymous, Tuesday, Abuse Spouses, Wednesday, Eating Disorders, Thursday, Say No to Drugs, Friday, Teen Suicide Watch, Saturday, The Soup Kitchen, and Sunday, America's Joyous Future. <laughs> uh, and, you know, I think that actually sort of summarizes a little bit of what, what the functions of religious religion are, to provide, in some ways, a social safety net, to uh, meet the needs of the less fortunate, to kind of configure our future um, and so forth. And these may sometimes actually be at odds with each other. And we've already seen some evidence of the importance of religion to people's lives and to medical care. And one survey of seriously ill patients found numerous attributes of a good death, and several of these were religiously tinged in the reading from uh, the death, uh, the, the, the lecture on death. So when, uh, in that article, when, uh, when we looked at what are some of the things that are, people regard as really important to them in part of a good death, Here's the list with being free of pain near the top, along with having someone who listens. But being at peace with God and praying both made it to the list, right? People, when they think about their deaths uh, in our society, uh, think that these are really important things uh, to do. But when we speak about religion, it's really important that we just immediately draw distinctions between three different components of religion. And the first idea is affiliation. So affiliation is what religion you are. Are you Buddhist? Are you Orthodox Jewish? Are you Pentecostalist Christian? Are you Mormon? Uh, are you Hindu? Are you whatever you are? What is the religion uh, that you are? The second idea is observance or participation. Here is, regardless of what religion you are, do you follow the tenets of that religion? Hmm? Are you observant? Do you go to temple? Uh, do you go to the mosque? Do you go to church? Do you obey whatever they do? Do you follow the marital uh, prescriptions? Do you eat the diet that's prescribed, for example? That's different than affiliation. People can be very observant in any affiliation or less observant in any affiliation. And those two things are yet again different from the notion of religiosity or spirituality. This is a kind of sense that many, most people have, a kind of transcendent awe. You can feel this feeling when you see a beautiful landscape, for example. Or you have a kind of sense that there's something, something transcendental about the world something that goes beyond uh, human understanding. And this sense of religiosity or a belief in a higher power, sometimes it, this, this idea can have many instantiations, is again distinct from the following, because you can be in any religion, you can be very, very observant, and you can be relatively more or less spiritual. In fact, you can be spiritual and not be in any formal religion. So all of those things uh, can mean different things. Now, if I, if I asked you, which of these things do you think would be more heritable in the sense of being partially genetically encoded, inherited biologically from your parents, not culturally, biologically, which of these things do you think would be the one that would be most likely to be inherited from your parents, partially encoded in your genes? Any thoughts? Yeah, Brooks? Uh, really yeah, yeah. That's right. We don't actually think there are genes for being Hindu or Muslim, for example, right? We don't think there's some genes that encode for that belief system. But we can imagine that there might be genes that might encode for how spiritual you are, that people might vary in this regard, just like they vary in their height, for example, or in their risk aversion, right? Some people are real risk takers, some are not. This temperamental feature and this notion, for example, of spirituality might be like that, for example. And, and the one in the middle, observance, could potentially also be partially heritable. You know, some of you were born, most of you were born very rule-abiding. 
right? You're going to do the, follow the rules, whatever they are. Some of you less so, uh, but probably have been weeded out before you got here uh, to Yale. Uh, but, by, you know, but people can vary in the degree to which they obey rules and regulations, you know, that they listen to authority, for example. And so that, too, might be partially uh, heritable. So let's look more closely, to, and I set that as a stage for some conversations we'll have later today and also uh, later in the course. So let's look more closely at the possible role of religion in health. And in general, religious people are healthier and live longer. And various aspects of religion can achieve this objective in a number of ways. They can affect, religion can affect health behavior, right? So the religion can specify things that you do in your life, for example, prohibiting drinking or smoking, uh, and that's salubrious, health uh, promoting. Or religion can affect your social networks, right? If you go, if you participate in these organ organized forms of social interaction, you can acquire social connections, which as we learned uh, recently, also are highly relevant to your, um, to your health. And we'll return to this as well. Or they can affect your mental health, your psychology, right? Some ways in which, whether it's the habits, the kind of ritualized habits, the, the, whether it's the singing or just showing up at the services, or uh, movements of particular kinds that are prescribed by the religion, uh, or belief systems about, you know, uh, that kind of relieve you of stress in various ways, these things can affect your psychology in ways that are uh, salubrious. And religion can also affect your uh, decision-making and ethical stance. So there are often ways in which being religious can affect the kinds of decisions you make uh, near the end of life, uh, for example. And the effect sizes associated with being religious, the magnitude of the impact on your health is actually quite high. Being unreligious can be worse for your health uh, expectancy or your life expectancy, for example, than being a smoker. So if you could choose to be a smoker or not smoker, or be religious or not religious, you gain more from being religious than you actually lose from being a smoker. And in fact, there's some evidence in the literature for a dose-response relationship as well. So the more religious you are, the healthier you are. And the effects of religion, in fact, can be positive or negative, depending on the religion and the practices. So some religions prescribe practices that are not very healthy, uh, and, and it's also important to understand that not all religious customs are ipso facto salubrious. So nothing I've said to you today should be confused with a claim that everything that every religion specifies is good for your health. Actually, that's wrong. But on average, it seems that religion and religious practices tend to be salubrious. So in other words, we can imagine that religion works causally via the following kinds of mechanistic paths which are similar to ones we introduced when we were talking about income a few lectures ago. So we imagine, for example, that religion might uh, influence health behaviors and then changing your health behaviors might affect your health, or your social connections and thereby improve your health, or your psychological states and thereby improve your health. And the psychology could include ad attitudinal shifts and stress coping uh, strategies. For example, precessory prayer. Who knows what precessory prayer is? Raise your hands if you've ever heard of precessory prayer. All right, precessory prayer is when you pray for yourself, okay? Intercessory prayer is when you pray for someone else. So precessory prayer, for example, can be very valuable to individuals via a variety of mechanisms, uh, for example, reflecting kind of meditation and other strategies that people uh, employ. But of course, the direction of the arrow could be the opposite. For example, you might go to church more often if you're healthy or if you're wealthy. So just like we discussed with the income example, the arrow could point in the opposite direction. Or perhaps uh, people would go to church more when they are sick or poor. So maybe, maybe it's the opposite. Maybe, in fact, what's happening is, is when you are sick or poor, that's when you go. So, so, uh, so here we have an example of health affecting religion rather than religion uh, affecting uh, health. And so, as with other things that we've considered in, the, in this course, there are problems with studying religion. And religion and health may be endogenous, may be co-determined and confounded with each other for a number of reasons. For example, there might be parental factors related to our early childhood that predispose us both to being religious and to having better health. So for example, the kinds of parents you have might determine your religion, usually they do, and or your observance, and also independently might affect your health. And so the relationship between religion and health might not be a causal arrow in either direction, just like we discussed a few weeks ago, might be something else that causes them uh, both. Or social connections might not be on the causal path between religion and health, but instead simply confound the relationship, causing both a taste for religious practice and better health. So who your friends are might influence 
whether you're observant or not, and who your friends are might influence whether you're healthy or not, and that's the nature of the relationship. Or social connections might not be on the causal path and instead simply confound the relationship uh, in the way that I'm showing here. So in other words, it's not, it's, not, uh, it's not this pathway, it's this pattern that we've seen before. Or the extent to which uh, that religion is genetically based, or to the extent that uh, religion is genetically based, there might be common genetic bases both for aspects of religion and for health. So to the extent that those aspects of religion, such as your religiosity or your observance, are partially heritable, those same constellation of genetic factors might also determine your health, and that's the reason why uh, religious people, let's say, might be healthier. And there's a good evidence, in fact, for the genetic basis of religion. So, um, so this can be quantified in a variety of ways, and there's this idea known as heritability. And heritability is the proportion of phenotypic variation in a population that can be attributable to genetic variation among individuals. So you look at the variation in some trait, like height or religiosity, uh, in a population, and then you say, well, what fraction of that variation has to do with people's genes, and what fraction of that variation has to do, for example, with how they were raised? So you kind of see what determines whether someone's on the upper end on average or on the lower end of the spectrum. And this is often done by using something called twin studies, which have a long and checkered history. Uh, I'm going to blow way by all of the criticisms and responses to the criticisms of twin studies. I'm just going to describe for you the basic idea behind twin studies. And the basic idea is that you take dizygotic, uh, same-sex dizygotic twins, fraternal twins, and obviously same-sex monozygotic twins. And these twins could either be reared together or reared apart. The latter is a detail which is very helpful in some studies. Uh, and, you, um, and you measure the extent to which religiosity, for example, you develop a measure for religiosity or how observant people are. And you go over here and you look at a set of monozygotic twins and you measure how, much, how religious this guy is and how religious his twin is. And you see what's the correlation between those two twins who are identical twins. Everyone with me so far? Then you go over here and you get a sample of fraternal twins, same sex so that they're comparable because those guys are same sex since they're identical twins. And now you measure how religious this guy is and how religious his or her twin is. And then you compare the correlation between these two guys. And then you compare the correlations in the two groups. And if the correlation is higher in the monozygotic twins than it is in the dizygotic twins, you say, oh my goodness, there must be something about religion that's heritable because the monozygotic twins of the same genes are more likely to have the same religion within each twin pair than they are in these dizygotic twins. That's the key insight that goes uh, into twin studies. And when you use these techniques and you study religion, you find or religiosity and other attributes of religion, you find that the heritability is in the range of 0.35 to 0.55. That means between 35% and 55% of the variation between people in how much religiosity they have or how observant they are and certain other attributes of religious beliefs can be explained by their genes. And it depends on the particular phenotype, of course. So frequency of attendance of religious service, religiosity are very heritable, but not specific religion. And this is roughly equal to the heritability of major depression, alcoholism, having an extreme right-wing ideology, but it's left, or having an extreme right-wing ideology, which is another phenotype you can measure, for instance, or extreme left-wing, but anyway, this is the one that was measured here, um, and, but less than the heritability of IQ. And sometimes such findings can seem very implausible. For example, believing in the literal truth of the Bible is also found to be partially heritable. How can that be? So for example, you look at monozygotic twins and you say, do you believe in the literal truth of the Bible? Yes, how much, or yes or no? Other twin, do you? Yes. Let's see how often their answers match. Over here, fraternal twins, you ask the same questions, you see, God, these guys' answers match less often. They're much less likely to both, at the same time, believe in the literal truth of the Bible or not believe in the literal truth of the Bible. And you conclude from that type of design, basically, that there's a kind of heritability and belief in the literal truth of the Bible. Do we think there's a gene for believing in the literal truth of the Bible? Or genes? No. So what could be going on there? Well, there could be other kinds of adaptive features or phenotypes in human beings, such as uh, believing in authority or deference to authority. That kind of a trait, deference to authority, it's not hard to imagine how deference to authority, little ones of us hundreds of thousands of years ago that were born and listened to our parents, we survived. Don't go there, there's a lion. Okay, mommy. 
uh, as compared to those of us that say, you know, don't go there, there's a line, oh, screw you, mom, and you go, <laughs> and you die, right? So, you know, listening to authority, listening to your parents, for example, and so to the extent that that's heritable, which it is, that might then be grafted onto its modern instantiation, which might be, you know, deference to textual uh, proscriptions or prescriptions. Now let's review some of these mechanisms by which religion might affect health. <coughs> Many religions have rules that provide for specific behaviors that can be salubrious. So they say, no smoking, no drinking, no bad food, no bad sex, you know, but they don't mean it the way you're thinking. Uh, they, <laughs> they mean, you know, certain kinds of sexual activity that's, you know, not allowed might be, you know, uh, described. And, uh, and this is fairly straightforward, right? There's nothing sophisticated about understanding how religion in this fashion might be uh, salubrious, might be uh, health expanding. And prayer, uh, like mindfulness more generally, can have a variety of beneficial and psychological, uh, beneficial psychological and physiologic effects. For example, one study examined a probability-based sample of 3,851 community-dwelling adults in North Carolina who were assembled between um, 1986 and followed for an average of about six years, and it found that those who rarely or never prayed or meditated had a higher risk of death over follow-up, but that this risk went away after adjusting for demographics and health. So maybe it was something about the people that were praying that made them healthy. Once you adjusted for that, the practice of praying didn't seem to make such a difference. However, among those who were impaired at baseline, the adjusted risk of not praying on survival was null, when they subset it now, but among those who were not impaired at baseline, the adjusted risk of not praying on survival was 1.63. So in other words, our prayers seem to help the well more than the sick, okay? So what this study found is that overall, once you control for all these other attributes, religion uh, in the form of prayer didn't seem to have much effect, but then when it subsetted the population on the sick and the well, they found that the well seemed to benefit, have life prolongation, uh, or quality adjusted life and prolongation, uh, the well did when they prayed uh, compared uh, to the sick. And the controls here included health practices, you know, what did you do, were you a smoker or a drinker, for example, social support, and other, uh, other religious practices. Now, incidentally, this topic is also connected to an ongoing struggle regarding religion in the public sphere uh, and about its bad effects. And one argument against religion seeks to undermine its potential health effects insofar as those that are used by, uh, devo insofar as these, this idea is used by devotees to justify the existence of a deity by inverting the formula. So to the extent that people think that religion heals you, and they use that not just in the kind of clinical, sociological way we're using now, but they use it in a kind of almost metaphoric way, that religion heals you, people have used this kind of idea and inverted it and there's a widely understood sort of counter meme, which is, you know, why does God hate amputees? Have you heard this expression? Why does God hate amputees? So one of the arguments that's used to argue against religion and the role religion plays in the public sphere is to say, look, religion is ridiculous because all these examples of religion being so good for you uh, always seem to improve the health of individuals in ways that we cannot see. God can, you know, if you're lame, God can fix you. If you're blind, God can fix you. If you have this unseen cancer, God can fix you. Uh, but actually, if you have an, ampu an amputated extremity, God never fixes you. It doesn't restore the extremity. And so this is meant as a kind of needling critique of religion. Do you see the point I'm making? So this kind of very clinical discussion we're having about the health benefits of religion has been co-opted by those that are also arguing against religion in this kind of needling way uh, in this regard. So God would seem to never answer the prayers of amputees, even as, as, uh, as God might answer the prayers of people with other sorts of illnesses. Anyway, leaving aside amputees, not only might prayer as a devotional act affect your survival, uh, but so perhaps might religious attendance. So uh, here is uh, what this slide shows is U.S. life expectancy at age 20 by religious affiliation in blacks and whites. So it looks at how often you attend, uh, attend religious, uh, religious meetings, and your average age of death, if, you, uh, if you're, for example, a white person and you never attend in your 20s, uh, your uh, average age of death is, let's say, 75, and it gets to be closer to 85 if you go to a church uh, more than once a week, and the gradient is similar uh, in the blacks. So it's the same positive as well in both, uh, both racial groups in this slide. So prayer is good for you. Going to church or synagogue or mosque or temple is good for you as well. 
And indeed, going to religious services regularly, that is once a week or more, is associated with a significant reduction in your risk of death. And an important question is by what mechanism it might have this effect. And here are some results based on the so-called Alameda County cohort of 5,286 people who were followed for 28 years, taken from your readings. Attenders, attenders went to services at least once a week and comprised 25% of the sample at baseline. So it looked at whether you at baseline were attending church or whatever uh, or not, and your survival, uh, and then it added all kinds of control variables and it found that if you control for the age, gender, ethnicity, education, and affiliation of the person, rel the relative hazard of death among frequent attenders was 0.64. So your risk of death was reduced 36% from one, which is, the, which is the standard, let's say here, uh, uh, if you were a regular attender, even taking into account these variables. And then if you added your baseline health conditions, it's reduced by 33%, plus social connections, plus health practices and BMI. As you add these additional factors, your relative risk of death gets smaller, so these factors are partially explaining this decrement. So you had a 36% reduction if I just took into, based on your religious attendance, if I just took into account certain features, but as I added more features, only 23% now, uh, you only have a 23% benefit. So the way religious attendance might help you is in part mediated by through the factors listed here uh, is the argument. But it's not eliminated. So even after taking all of these things into account, there still seems to be some benefit of religious attendance in your 20s for your long-term uh, survival. Um, and so the idea here is that religion might affect health behaviors which affect health uh, in this kind of a path. And so once you control for those things, the impact of religion uh, declines. And religious attendance indeed has these specific associations with particular health behaviors and circumstances. So if you go out now and you look, okay, uh, is it in fact the case that religious people are less likely to smoke or engage in bad sex or whatever? Uh, the answer is yes. Uh, so for example, if you look at um, uh, religious service attendance and subsequent health behaviors, improved health practices, people who are religious at baseline are almost twice as likely to quit smoking. Their odds of smoking cessation are 90% higher than the reference, which is one. Uh, more likely to quit drinking, more likely to increase their exercise, more likely to lose weight. Uh, and uh, if you look at improved social connections, people who are religious are more likely to stay married, more likely to have increased non-church group involvement, 50%, 58% more likely, and more likely to have increased contact with friends uh, and relatives. So there is evidence that religion does have these effects on these intermediate uh, factors. And in fact, religion can provide both real and imagined connections. And these connections may be either by a, by a prayer or by uh, attendance. So imagine here that there's some kind of a deity, and these two people have a connection to each other, but they have no connection to the deity. Or the person may imagine that he or she's connected to a deity, this person is unconnected, uh, or they can be both connected, or they can be connected to each other and also both connected to the same uh, imagined you know, data. So these connections can be real or imagined. But one of the interesting things about religion, and I, I think I'll come back to this in a few lectures, is one of the ideas about the way religion has arisen in our species, or religious beliefs have arisen in our species, is by uh, coming, being grafted onto our sense of social connection. So here the idea is if we both believe in the same God, or both feel a connection to the same God, we're two degrees removed from each other. So your friend's friend is, is, uh, is all this person who was previously a stranger to you, because you believe in the same deity, now becomes a friend of a friend. So this kind of, this idea of, uh, of, a, of, a, uh, of a deity, uh, that this may have emerged in our species as a proxy for some other person in our species. So our attitudes towards each other kind of eventually got expanded to our attitudes towards a supernatural uh, power. And here's one college student's drawing of her social network. So this student was asked to draw her social network uh, in a variety, and she was asked to just draw the people that are important to you in your life and their connections between them. Uh, and so you can see that she spontaneously uh, drew God. So here's herself, here's mom and dad, here's sister one and sister two, like cat in a hat. Uh, here's a grandma and grandpa. Here's a friend. He's, this, this woman is blessed because her, both of her sisters are friends with the same friend that she is. Uh, and here is, here's God, which she wasn't asked to put God on the list. 
She thought of God in the same way that she thought of her friends and her family and so forth, and drew connections. And, and thankfully, everyone is connected to God here. Uh, she didn't exclude anyone from a uh, you know, connection between uh, God and that person. So human religious sensibility, in fact, may have an re evolutionary origin that's related to our desire for meaning and distinctly our desire for connection. And as I said, maybe grafted onto it. In fact, there is an inheritance of sociality, uh, the need for the company of others, and this tendency to react to perceived, and the tendency to react to perceived social isolation. And in fact, if you think about it, human virtues, when you think about what it is that we think of as virtues in our society, what are those things? We speak about love, for example, or honesty, or justice, or kindness. But we don't mean those virtues vis-a-vis -vis yourself. We're not interested in whether you love yourself, or whether you're kind to yourself, or whether you're just to yourself, or honest to yourself. I mean, maybe we are a little. What we're really interested in when we talk about virtues is whether you express those to other people. Hmm? So morality, by and large, is a kind of social morality. We're interested in the expression of morality insofar as it relates to the interactions with other people. So there's a deep connection between the moral sensibility and our sociality and our, our religious uh, ideology. And in fact, this suggests that spirituality and sociality may have a shared evolutionary origin and may be related. Sociality may serve as a model for spirituality, and people may form a kind of personal connection to a deity. And insofar as there is a, insofar as there is a survival advantage in being connected, and it turns out that there are health benefits even in perceived connections, not just real connections, then a deity may function as a replacement for other people when those people are not available. So if you imagine that we evolve to feel, to be better and feel better when we're near other people, you can imagine how eventually if we evolve to think, oh my goodness, I'm connected to the supernatural being, even if I'm not actually with the real person. If, in a, if you have an imaginary friend when you were little, and that imaginary friend eased your suffering and anxiety, the same kind of, and it did, the same kind of um, practice and sensibility could have evolved with now with respect to a deity, rather than, with a, with them, rather than with respect to a real friend, or even an imaginary friend. Now lest we make too much of this or get too metaphysical, remember that people can also feel connection to teddy bears or TV characters, or celebrities they've never met. I mean, have you ever witnessed people yelling at a TV screen or a movie? You know, don't do it, he's a bum! Uh, you know, so in that, in that moment, you feel a connection to this person that you know is imaginary. You can speak to the person, right? And it's a natural human thing um, to do. You know, don't get in the car uh, with that person you might yell um, to the screen. Um, oh, of course, and people also, raise your hands if you've ever had pets. Yeah, so people also feel connected to their pets. Here's another drawing uh, that this woman uh, drew. Here's herself, and here she drew her cat and all of her dogs who uh, uh, do not have connections uh, to her cat, and she felt they're not connected uh, to each other. Uh, and then she drew the various patterns uh, among them. So people can feel connected to their pets in part, or similarly perhaps, that they might feel connected uh, to a deity. And people are especially want to feel connection to inanimate or imagined objects when they are alone, such as when they are cast away or at sea. And in turn, this may be related to our tendency to see faces in the most unlikely places. So who knows what these are? What's this one here on the upper left? Wilson, right? Uh, so what happens to, uh, what's his name? Um, Tom Hanks. Yeah, I forgot the character's name. But anyway, that guy. Uh, in the movie, he's on an island, I forgot, for like 10 or 20 years, some huge amount of time. And eventually he draws this little uh, figure and he talks to this character, uh, this, this ball the whole time, and really feels, almost dies trying to save the ball, right, late like in the movie. Uh, who knows what this is? Yeah? Old Man in the Mountain. Yeah, Old Man in the Mountain. You're, where are you from? Uh, yeah, exactly. So this is in New Hampshire. This is a, a, a rock formation that was in a mountain, which, alas, just collapsed, right, a couple of years ago. So this, this whole block of rock fell off this mountain. But people used to talk about the old man of the mountain. Who knows what this is? Mars, yeah, this is, a, you know, recently NASA, a few years ago, finally released the photographs that showed, no, there's no space that was put up by aliens on Mars. This is obviously a mermaid. Sailors, you know, on long voyages had imagined these mythical creatures for a long time. And this is, of course, just a mop here at Yale College, <laughs> uh, which, uh, which, you know, kind of looks like a face when I walk by. 
Um, I was lonely that day. <laughs> Even a mop was appealing. Um, now, I want to discuss one result, however, that stresses the symbolic and not the material workings of religion. This is a very important result. It was in your readings. And what's interesting about this result is so far everything we've talked about, about how religion works, has to do with whether religion affects your behaviors. You know, do you smoke or drink or go to church, for example? Or, or how it affects your social connections. You know, do you have friends that you make as a result of your religion, uh, for example? But this example, taken from the readings, talks about the symbolic importance of religion. And it looks at deaths from natural causes around the Harvest Moon Festival for elderly Chinese and Jewish women in California for a 24-year period. On the y-axis is the mortality, the standard measured using standardized residuals. You can ignore that. Mortality is higher at the top and lower at the bottom. And the two colors, the red, are Chinese women, and, uh, and, the, uh, and the yellow are Jewish women. And it looks at weeks before and after the Harvest Moon Festival. So when you look at the Chinese women, you see it's bumping around a little bit, but it takes a big dip just below the Harvest Moon Festival and then goes up right after the Harvest Moon Festival. Who can tell us about the Harvest Moon Festival in this room? Anyone? Yeah, Gianna? Um, so, I didn't know that was going to read, but basically, um, it's a festival that people go to and it's like changes Okay, stop for a second. That's exactly right. So she's highlighting a feature which is really important methodologically, which is that it's a movable feast. The Harvest Moon Festival moves around in calendar time. It's not always at the same date. Okay? Yeah, go on. Uh, it wasn't really that clear, but Chinese women, in particular, in the New York, say a very important role in it. Okay, so in this religious occasion, uh, quasi-religious uh, uh, occasion, uh, elderly Chinese women have a very important symbolic role uh, in this uh, festival. And what they found in the study was is that Chinese women seemed to be able to postpone their deaths at, when the Harvest Moon Festival was imminent. Now, did the women become immortal because of the imminence of the Harvest Moon Festival? No, there was always a price to pay. Their mortality then had a compensatory rise right after the Harvest Moon Festival, right? So just because the Harvest Moon Festival is coming doesn't mean you live forever. It means you postpone your death by a week or two, and then you have to pay the rebirth, and you die afterwards. But it leads to this dip and rise pattern that occurs right here. Now, the point that Gianna just mentioned about the movable feast was important, because if you saw this dip and rise, let's say in Christians at Christmas, if you were a snarky critic and you said, oh, Christians have a decline in mortality just before, you know, in the middle of December and then a rise afterwards in January, what might a critic say in response to that? Yeah, what's your name? Joe. Joe, yeah? Yeah, it might just be that the seasons, you know, there's more precipitation in January and less in December, and there's a decline in mortality that always occurs in December. It's got nothing to do with whether you're a Christian and believe in the importance of Christmas or anything else like that, right? So the reason it's a movable feast is really helpful because it moves around in the calendar, and no matter when it occurs, the dip was before then and the rise was after then, regardless of the day of the month or month of the year that it occurred. First point. Why did they have the Jewish group in this population as well? Raise your hands. Yeah, uh, Emma. Uh, because the Harvest Moon Festival goes to the Exactly. A very clever design. So far as we know, if you're Jewish, you don't really care about the Harvest Moon Festival. There's no particular reason it should have any symbolic importance in your case. So that functions as a control group, and the fact that there's no difference further supports their claim that this dip and rise uh, is uh, important and has to do with the symbolic uh, impact of, uh, of religion in this case. So mortality among Chinese dips by 35% in the week before the Harvest Moon Festival and peaks by the same amount in the week afterwards. And the effect is seen disproportionately in elderly Chinese women for whom this is a central holiday and not among other Chinese or among uh, Jews. Uh, and the largest dip and peak pattern were seen for strokes followed by heart disease. So it seemed that this effect also was occurring preferentially for causes of mortality that we might plausibly imagine your body attitude could affect, right? It's not like you decline in pancreatic cancer dips just before it rises. For strokes, it dips and, uh, and then rises. And this study documents the ability of symbolic ideas to affect survival. And humans, in fact, respond to symbolism. This slide shows something known as reference-dependent preferences for finishing times by marathon runners. Raise your hands if you've ever competed in a timed sport. 
Okay, so many of you have competed in a time sport. And it turns out when you compete in a time sport, you seem to care about arbitrary temporal landmarks. This shows uh, marathon finishing times for pool data regarding nearly 10 million finishes. And the dark bars highlight the density of the minute bin just prior to each 30 minute threshold. This is in marathon runners. So this is the number of finishes. So this is actual data, but this is, there's a little bump just before the three hour mark and then a compensatory decline afterwards. And the three and a half, you see how it spikes up and then goes down. And at four, it spikes up and goes down. So the runners run a little extra faster to get across the finish line just before the three hour mark or the three and a half hour mark to get their time in under the wire. So people care about such symbolism even in the case uh, like this. There's significant bunching of performance at these round numbers. And this bunching is driven by planning uh, and adjustments and effort provision near the finish line. That's why people are kind of seeing where the finish line is in performing and cannot be explained by explicit rewards. For example, it's not like you have to finish by a certain time to qualify for the Boston Marathon or by peer effects uh, or other institutional features such as pace setters. There wasn't someone that was running a perfect three, three hour marathon and you just ran behind him. That's not much explaining of these results. Now, I want to digress as well to a quirky literature on intercessory prayer, which I mentioned just a while ago. So precessory prayer is when you pray for yourself, and as we saw, it might help you when you do that. But what if someone else prays for you? Can that help? You think it can help if other people pray for you? Would it matter if you knew if they were praying for you or not? Or not? Do you think it can help you if you know that other people are praying for you? Raise your hands. Do you think you could know it would help you if you don't know whether other people are praying for you? Hard to say. Well, people thought, let's study this. Let's look at the intercessory prayer and whether it can affect people's survival and look at whether it makes a difference whether you know that people are praying for you or you don't know. This is a recent and large study of this phenomenon. It looks, it's a randomized controlled trial of the effects of remote intercessory prayer on ICU outcomes. So this large randomized study, what they did is, is they took about 1,000 patients that were admitted to a cardiac care unit, and then they were then randomized to a prayer group and a usual care group. Now in a prayer group, I don't know if I have the exact what was done, uh, yeah, in the prayer group, the, the, the secretary in the ICU called an intercessory prayer team leader uh, at a nearby church and gave them the name uh, uh, of the person that was admitted. Said, please pray for Joe. He's been admitted to the CCU today. In the usual care group, there was no such thing that was done. Uh, and then there were two groups of people, some that were prayed for and some that were not. And then they estimated the effects of intercessory prayer on the Mid-American Heart Institute cardiac care unit scores and length of stay in the CCU. So here's a measure of illness severity. And what they found was that the people who got usual care had a measure of 7, and the prayer group had a measure of 6.35. There was an 11 point decrease, which was statistically significant, suggesting that being prayed for uh, mattered uh, in this situation. And the patients here did not know that they were being prayed for. Yeah, what's your name? Uh, I'm not the one behind you. Yeah. Birdie. I'm sorry. Birdie. Birdie. Uh huh. Um, no, I don't know if they weed out. I think you just didn't matter whether you were an atheist or any religion. You know, someone prayed for you. I suppose, but they didn't know if they were being prayed for. So they maybe you would be harmed if you knew that people of the wrong religion were praying for you. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> Actually, I don't think it hurts, but anyway, yes. Um, I forgot your name. Rosario. Rosario. Were the nurses aware that children were there? They weren't children, they were adults, and I don't think the nurses were aware. I don't think anyone was aware except for the prayers, the people that were doing the prayer. Okay? Yes, in fact, I know that's the case. That was the point of the design, right? Because, of course, as you're suggesting, if I'm a nurse, and whether I'm religious or not, I actually could go multiple ways. If I'm a nurse and I'm caring for someone, I say, well, I don't have to take good care of this patient. Someone's praying for them. That would not be a good idea. Or you might think, oh, I better make extra effort for this patient because someone's praying for them. No. So the healthcare worker didn't know the assignment uh, in this situation. Now, what was interesting to me about this paper was not the actual finding so much, but rather the rhetorical flourish and the, the kind of social construction of knowledge that these authors deployed to discuss their results. So here is, um, here's what they said. This is a quoting from their paper. Neither this study nor that of Bird, the previous study, provided any mechanistic explanation for the possible benefits of intercessory prayer. However, however, others have speculated as to what they might be. And they generally fall into two broad categories. 
natural or supernatural explanations. The former explanation would attribute the beneficial effects of intercessory prayer to real but currently unknown physical forces that are generated by the intercessors and received by the patients. And the lateral explanation would be, by definition, beyond the ken of science. However, this trial was designed to explore not a mechanism, but a phenomenon. Clearly, proof of the latter must precede exploration of the former. We have to first document a phenomenon before we can explore the mechanism, the authors are saying. And listen to the analogy they invoke. By analogy, when James Lind, by clinical trial, determined that lemons and limes cured scurvy aboard the HMS Salisbury in 1753, a very famous trial that was done by James Lind, he not only did not know about ascorbic acid, he did not even understand the concept of a nutrient. There was a natural explanation for his findings that could be clarified, that would be clarified centuries later, but his inability to articulate it did not invalidate his observations. So what these guys are doing is they're saying, we don't know the mechanism that might be working here. We go do an experiment and we find some effect. Who knows? And don't be angry at us. We're just like the guys that discovered that, uh, that fruits uh, prevent scurvy, which was a big deal, and that we didn't know about how that could work for centuries, as they say. Well, um, here's what they further argued, which I also thought was quite interesting. They said, although we cannot know why we obtained the results we did, we can comment on what our data do not show. For example, we have not proven that God answers prayer or that God even exists. I'm relieved to hear that. Um, it was intercessory prayer, not the existence of God, that was tested here. All we've observed is that when, hospital, when individuals outside of the hospital speak or think the first names of hospitalized patients with an attitude of prayer, the latter appear to have a better CCU experience. Although our findings would be expected to occur by chance alone, only one out of 25 times that such an experiment was conducted, chance still remains a possible explanation for our results. Now, the reason I said I'm relieved is not because I'm taking a position on religion, although I'm happy to if you want to talk to me about that, but rather because I think that there's no scientific way, by definition, religion is not scientifically provable or disprovable, right? It's like the principle of who studied Karl Popper and falsifiability, right? To be a science, you have to be able to imagine an experiment that proves the claim. And there's no experiment we can imagine that would prove or disprove the existence of God. Therefore, the existence of God is not a scientific question. It's a completely different uh, question. Now, here's another study of intercessory prayer, now with a focus not only on whether prayer works, but also on whether knowing if you are being prayed for has any effect. So these guys did the study we talked about earlier, when they randomized people to three different arms. They were uh, being prayed for, but were uncertain if they were being prayed for. They were not being prayed for, but they didn't know if they were being prayed for or not. Uh, and then they were being prayed for, but they were certain that they were being prayed for. Now notice that they didn't give a situation in which you were certain and you were not being prayed for. Like they weren't lied to. You're being prayed for, but actually I'm not going to pray for you. Right? So they excluded that arm of a, what would have been a strictly two by two factorial design uh, in this study. And the study had two main findings. First, intercessory prayer itself had no effect on whether complications occurred in this population after coronary artery bypass surgery. And second, patients who were certain that intercessors would pray for them had a higher rate of complications than patients who were uncertain but, did, uh, but, uh, but also received prayer. So if you look at two groups of people, both of whom were prayed for, that group that knew they were being prayed for, compared to the group that couldn't know, wasn't sure, the group that knew they were being prayed for uh, did worse on the far right, uh, group three, that was certain on the y-axis is some measure of, uh, of uh, percentage of patients that have a complication, and the percentage is higher in the group uh, on the far right. And the authors noted that they had no clear explanation for the observed excess of complications in patients who were certain that intercessors would pray for them. Although postoperative atrial fibrillation and flutter was responsible for much of the excess of complications in the group three patients, this outcome is only one of the complications that contributed to the composite outcome, and the excess may in fact be some kind of a chance finding. And, it, um, and in fact, there have been so many now studies of intercessory prayer that there's actually been a meta-analysis of these studies. So people are very interested in this question, or have been in the last 20 years, and there have been many randomized control studies that have been done, and now they're even to the point where people can collect those studies, combine the results across studies, and try to estimate, is there some impact or not? 
So this is a meta-analysis of intercessory prayer. It includes the BIRD study that I didn't mention, plus a couple other studies that we discussed. And this looks at the relative risk that favors the control versus favors prayer. And here's the summary measure, which basically is finding that across these studies, and there's since been another meta-analysis, there's no real effect uh, of intercessory prayer that we can see uh, on individuals. But the reason I'm bringing up these examples is not so much because, because I, think, I don't think that there's an effect of intercessory prayer on your health outcomes. I do think there's an effect of precessory prayer, but that's another topic. Uh, it's because I think there's a kind of interesting epistemology here, or a production of knowledge question here, about how scientists are thinking about prayer, the intersection of religion and health and medicine at the beginning of the 21st century that these types of studies highlight. So this is being kind of debated in, among scientists and other people who are interested in this topic in very interesting ways that are, you know, you saw the, the invocation of Lind. People are trying to feel their way to how we can think about and talk about these topics. And this meta-analysis led another colleague of mine to do the following retroactive study of prayer. And he noted in response to this systematic review, he noted the following. A recent systematic review of the efficacy of distance healing concluded that approximately 57%, 13 of 23 of the randomized placebo-controlled trials of distance healing showed a positive treatment effect and that the evidence thus warrants further study. So, so actually there was a subsequent meta-analysis after this that had us 23 total studies and found that 13% of those studies found some benefit of intercessory prayer. And so my colleague said, look, people are doing this. So let me do my own study. And he said the following. Since we cannot assume a priori that time is linear as we perceive it, or that God is limited by linear time as we are, the intervention was carried out four to 10 years after the patient's infection and hospitalization. The hypothesis was that remote retroactive intercessory prayer reduces mortality and shortens the length of stay in hospital and duration of fever. So this colleague of mine says, you know, I'm going to enter this fray in a mischievous way. I'm going to say, well, if God is omnipotent uh, and isn't, doesn't abide by human, uh, you know, with the same constraints we have, why does this study have to be a prospective randomized trial? Why can't we do a retroactive study where we take a group of people that were hospitalized 10 years ago and pray for them now and see whether our praying for them now affects the outcomes they had, you know, 10 years ago? So he takes a group of hospitalized patients from 10 years ago and he randomly assigns them to two groups. One group of which is prayed for now, one group for which is not prayed for now. And then he sees what happened to those patients after they had been prayed for. Do you understand his design? Do you know, can you see where he's going with it? Right? So he's entering the fray in this other kind of mischievous way. And here's what he finds with respect to the effect of retroactive remote intercessory prayer. He takes 3,393 patients with sepsis, that's a bloodborne infection, between 1990 and 1996. And in the year 2000, a remote retroactive prayer was said for the well-being and full recovery of the intervention group as part of the remote of the randomized controlled trial. And he found that mortality was 28% in the group that was prayed for versus 30% in the group that was not, and this was statistically significant. And the mean length of stay was also shorter by a day, and the duration of fever uh, was about slightly shorter, but there in one decimal place it doesn't show. And he said, he concludes his study, this is now he is responding in the scientific literature to the original study, uh, which, uh, which I think I assigned you. No, I can't remember if I signed this. Did I sign the study with a Lind? No, I didn't assign that. He's responding in the literature to the study that's published in the scientific literature that invokes Lind, and he says the following. The intervention is cost effective, probably has no adverse effects, and should be considered for clinical practice. Further studies may determine the most effective form of this intervention and its effect in other severe conditions and may clarify its mechanism. So he's really being biting, right? He publishes this article in the British Medical Journal. This paper has been cited so many times, uh, it's unbelievable. So, so um, and what's fascinating to me then is that this paper spawned a plethora of hundreds of comments and postings. For example, one person noted that one explanation was that, quote, there was indeed actually divine intervention in such a case, it seems to me more plausible, this is what the poster is saying, in fact it is more parsimonious, he says, to suppose that instead of deciding the length of stay and fever duration for each patient, he, meaning God, did something simpler for him, to decide the outcome of the coin tossing, 
allocating those who had longer stays in the control group. If it is the case, there was not proper randomization, and Lebovici's study doesn't offer anything new, this critic said. So I, what I find fascinating about this debate is that from the point is, is that this type of scientific inquiry is being used to study prayer at all. And from the point of view of the history of science, I think it is very interesting that these studies of intercessory prayer have appeared in the last 20 years at a moment in which there's a lot of anxiety in the public sphere about the role of religion in modernity. And remember when we were talking about medicalization, we talked about how we increasingly see things that were non-medical in health terms and we're simultaneously struggling with the fact that things that were previously seen as non-medical in health terms, surrendering the impact of religion as a kind of explanatory model for illness and well-being, is raising this tension both for scientists and for lay people at the same time. So it's kind of related to this, this whole debate in scientific literature is related to this uh, secularization, if you will, of our society. So several aspects of religion appear to be good uh, for people's health. Are there any questions about that? Yeah, what's your name? Ike. Ike. Yeah, 104. That it was just chance, yeah. That and if you did this study 25 times, one out of 25 would have yielded um, this result. Fewer than one in 25 would have failed it, that's right. But, but is that, that's just a statistical measure based on the quality of the data samples, not the quality yes. of Yeah, so I think I've understood your question. So if you're asking, would, if people did multiple such studies and we meta-analyzed them, combined them, would we find an effect? That, of course, was what was being done with the real studies by the meta-analysis. Saying, well, look, if this is chance, then we would find, you know, we looked at all the studies that people had done, we'd find some sample of them that showed an effect. Most wouldn't, and that's how we would know it was chance. But if we're finding many, many studies that are showing an effect, that really gives our confidence. If you're asking if Lebovici went back and re-randomized, uh, from my perspective as a scientist, what happened here was a fluke, right? Dumb luck. Yeah. So he randomly assigned him, unless he made the whole thing up. You know, he didn't actually randomly assign him. He you know, moved some patients around to get the numbers to line up just right. But assuming he actually randomized them, then you know, he was got lucky, quote unquote, and the, the group that was assigned to prayer had retroactively a shorter length of stay. Well, it was random, so you didn't have to control for anything. So I randomly assign you guys to be prayed for and you guys not to. I don't really, in principle, if you're a big enough number, have to measure anything about you. Yeah. Other questions or points? Yeah, and I also have to say, by the way, like, like when we talk about race and when we talk about suicide, we talk about doctor-caused injury, you know, these are all sensitive topics. So I, I, I'm flamboyant, but I do not mean to come across as glib. Like, it's interesting to me, like, what, what we've been discussing today. Yeah. Lebovici study? No. You could repeat it and see what would happen. That would be a funny thing to do and say, you know, Lebovici previously so this. The problem is, well, try it and see what happens. You know, maybe you could do it with the upcoming midterm. You know, you could assign half the class uh, to, you know, be prayed for by you. And, uh, and if they do worse, they can find they know where you live. <laughs> or you can wait till after the midterm and then do it retroactively. That would be the best example. Yeah, what's your name? Angela, uh huh? No, I think he just prayed for them in his office. I think he just pulled the charts. I think he just pulled the charts from the hospital file room, randomly assigned them, and, and then he just sort of set an incantation over this stack. It was very efficient. Yes. Speak up. I'm sorry. He may have in the study, I don't remember, but again, with a sample size of 3,000, it really wasn't necessary. You could just line up 3,000 charts and ran, flip a coin 3,000 times, and the severity of illness will be roughly the same in the 1,500 coin tosses on either side. Yeah, in the back. Brooks, is that Brooks again? Yeah. I don't remember. I don't think it matters. 
I think I think it was the uh, mono, the, uh, mono, the I think it was uh, um, uh, it was the uh, uh, um, uh, Jehovah. Yes. Uh, well, actually, this study was done before HIPAA, and only the first names were given, and the patients were consented. They were told that the patients were told that they would be randomly assigned. They were in an experimental study of prayer. But you said that they weren't aware. They weren't aware of which group they were assigned to. So, unbeknownst to you, I'm going to be praying for half of you for the midterm, not the other half. <laughs> and you won't know which group you're in. Other I, other questions. Yes, what's your name? Avery. Avery, uh-huh. What is like the general attitude towards the study in the science Um Well, Lebovici had a mis mischievous intent, right? He was not actually a proponent of intercessory prayer. So the, the people who, are, who take a skeptical eye towards the benefits of religion are kind of quite happy with Lebovici. The people who think uh, not only that religion is good, but specifically that intercessory prayer is good, don't don't know what to make of Lebovich, because on the one hand they think, well actually the study shows what we think, but on the other hand they know that he's not actually in their camp. So if you're interested, you should just go and look at the comments. I mean, there are hundreds of comments and citations. If you, if you do a, say, look at who cited this paper, you'll see in the last 10 years it's been cited all over the place. Actually, it would be a great term paper for a class to look at the, the, the sequelae of the Lebovich, this Lebovich paper. In some other class, we don't have term papers in this one. Yeah. Yeah, there have been case studies. The Catholic Church, of course, has to do that in order, in order to canonize anyone, right? They go in and you have to cure, you have someone has to be healed, and they try to find examples where medical records, and they get very sophisticated. They look at MRI scans and CT scans and everything else. There was just a paper published in Cell. Did anyone see it on recombinant uh, chromosomal shattering in, uh, in patients with, uh, with this very rare immune deficiency disease? Raise your hands if you saw this paper. No one is it in molecular biology? Anyway, there was this woman who was born with one of like 50 people on the planet with this very rare condition, and her whole, I forgot what it's called, it's, like, it's like a horrible condition. You have like immune deficiency, you've got warts all over your body, and, and other kinds of problems, you have lots of infections. And, um, and she was spontaneously cured because of a radical genetic mutation that took place in one of her chromosomes, where the whole chromosome was rearranged and gave rise to a new set of progenitor stem cells in her bone marrow, which then repopulated her whole bone marrow, and she was cured of her condition from this uh, incredible, just published in Cell like, last week. And um, they did the whole, and in fact, what was amazing is, is her, she sent her daughters to, to, the, to NIH to participate in a study of this rare condition, and they said, oh, mom is all recovered. And they're like, what do you mean mom's recovered? And they're like, mom's fine. She doesn't have infections anymore, or warts or anything else. So the docs at NIH bring mom in, and they do these studies, and they can't believe what they see. Her whole bone marrow has been replaced by actually healthy cells that were clearly generated on her own. OK. so. Um, so several aspects of religious life appear to be good for people's health, and the mechanism of such effects are plausible, and the effect sizes are meaningful. Nevertheless, it's also important to note some of the very real negative consequences of religion. So I highlighted all the positive consequences today, but I think there are some negative consequences. Namely, that religion can be used to justify hatred, aggression, and prejudice, and it often is. All religions do this. It's you know, an in-group, out-group phenomenon. Uh, it may restrict scientific and medical inquiry. We've got a serious problem in various parts of the world with respect to vaccine avoidance and religious ideas. Uh, it can be judgmental, alienating, and exclusive, which isn't good for anyone to feel excluded. It may restrict rather than free human agency and spirit. Uh, it may induce excessive guilt. It may encourage dangerous behavior. Some religions encourage all kinds of practices, like whether it's snake biting or snake handling or cutting yourself in different sorts of ways, which can't be good for you. Uh, it may encourage magical thinking and the suspension of reason, which generally speaking is not good for you. And it may be used instead of medical care. For example, it may be used to justify a failure to seek prenatal, obstetrical, or other medical care. There's an example in Connecticut right now of a, of a young woman that's refusing, actually it's not quite on religious grounds, a young woman that's refusing treatment for a treatable cancer. Uh, and, uh, and the court ordered her to get treatment. And you actually, if you're a minor and your parents say it violates our religion, this happened to me more than once when I was in training, the Jehovah's Witness example. I had two patients in my three years as a house officer at UPenn where actually the Jehovah's Witness came in and said, I would rather die than get a blood transfusion. When they were an adult, we respected it. In one case, the patient died. 
In the other case, the patient did not, actually didn't need the transfusion. And there were other cases, not of my own, where it was a child, and the parent says, do not give the blood transfusion, and the 12-year-old says, do not transfuse me, I'll go to hell, and we're like, no, sorry, we're gonna transfuse you because otherwise you will die. So you don't have the same rights as a child, obviously, and the parents can't speak to them. Um, it can be used to justify failure of vaccination, and can it be used to stop medication in order to demonstrate faith, which often can be uh, disastrous. Now, people can clearly refuse drugs, drug transfusions or treatment uh, or treatment for snake bites and so on according to their belief, and this is not ethically or legally controversial for adults of sound mind at all. Now, any adult in this country for any reason can refuse medical care at any time, but it does become very problematic, of course, when children are involved. But I think the reason religion is so especially salient uh, when people are truly very sick and is not just relevant to their behaviors over the life course or to whether they fall ill, is that religion lies at the cathexis of vulnerability, uncertainty, loneliness, fear, and illness. And you cannot take care of people at the end of life, as, as I have, or, or witness people dying and not ask religious questions. It's, it's just almost impossible to be in that situation and not think about uh, deeper questions of meaning uh, and so forth. And religious, religion feels a very special sort of void when people are seriously ill, and it cannot easily be ignored when caring for seriously ill patients, either if they're your loved ones or if you're a physician. There'll be no, that's it for today, there'll be no, uh, no office hours on Thursday, and good luck on the, on the test.